Okay, appreciate all of you on the internet that's taking these classes with us and uh, over in the Netherlands there's more and more people writing wanting to be involved in this so we're very excited about that. Uh, I get really good questions from those folks over there and they, uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. You know, it shows me that they're really, they're asking the right questions and that's what's important. People need to ask the right questions. So uh, I sent out on the internet and I've given to every one of you here in the class the seventh chapter for our book on the, on the book of Esther. Once Elaine gets it edited with her edit, then I'll go ahead and put together the full book with all the pictures in it. And here I'll print it out and give it to each student and then we'll send it out on the internet for everybody else and you can take it to whoever um, binds booklets together and have that done at Office Depot or whatever. But hopefully we'll finish this up within the next, this week and maybe next week and we may need a third week to go on depending how it goes. Okay. And then I will announce what we're going to start on. Donna's uh, suggested the Virtuous Woman, Elaine suggested the Garments of the High Priest and we'll just see and let you know pretty soon on that. Also, uh, I'm not going to do any test questions on this because I want to give everybody time to do their term papers. So if your term papers aren't in, go ahead and do them as soon as you can. Three or four pages shouldn't be too hard to do. People have been sending some really good ones in and everybody's done well. We've, uh, most, most of you have done A's and A pluses on everything. So, and I'm not just giving them to you just to give them to you. They're, they are really good. I, one lady has sent a bunch of uh, verses to me. I sent it back and she sent me a new one. And, uh, it, it was excellent and she ended up with an A+. Plus. So I'm very proud of what everybody's doing. So we want to start on chapter 7 of the book, not the book of Esther, but chapter, chapter 7 of our, our book for our class. Uh, we could do a lot more uh, in this. There's many more chapters to this book, but we're gleaning what's really vi vital to us today. At the end of uh, the rest of the book, it just shows the results of what Esther did. And I'm not going to take the time to dig through that, but Let's go to Esther 2.17. It's in your notes. It says, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon, a crown upon her head and made her queen instead of, uh, instead of Vashti. Now, when we see this where it says she obtained grace and favor, everybody had grace and favor, but she obtained it. And to me, that just means that we are obtaining an understanding. We have grace and we have favor, do we not? Yes. yes. Favor means the image of God. We have the very image of God. We are here on this earth as His body, and we have tremendous grace from Him. Uh, I have made comments before about how we really don't depend on grace anymore. Some people don't understand that. But grace, to me, is, uh, what is that old saying? Mercy is not giving you what you deserve, and grace is giving you what you don't deserve. Well, we do deserve everything because we're in, in the Father. We're one with Him. Uh, my dad, uh, if, my, if my dad was a well-off person, had lots of money and all kinds of stuff, and he's my dad and I live my, my, with my dad, I don't need grace from him. I mean, it's mine, right? Mm -hmm. I'm one with him. Everything that he has is mine. And so we're, what we're doing is we're finding out what the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was, and we're living out of that. And we have a scripture, I think it's in Colossians, that says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was very, very rich, he became very, very poor, that through him we might become rich. And the word rich is not talking about money, it's understanding. It's, it's the Christ life, it's living out of it. So that's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have that already. So uh, Paul was told by God, when Paul was asking the Lord to deliver him from his dependency to lean on his religious upbringing, God spoke to him in the spirit, and, and Christ spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient. Well, what, what did he mean by that? What's my grace? It's the Christ life inside of you. So if we're going to depend on his grace, we're going to learn how to live out of that. And so that's what, to me, that word obtain means. As we study and as we go through these teachings, as we go through the word, as we listen to the Holy Spirit and our teachers, we're obtaining understanding. And once you know that you know, you can live out of it. A couple of the sisters in the Netherlands wrote me uh, last night, and I haven't finished answering all their questions. But, you know, they're, they're just now learning these truths. They're hearing these things. They're hearing that there's only one power. They're hearing that we have true supply. And like most people, and I understand it, they want to live out of it now. I mean, I want it now. I want patience. I want patience right now, don't you? <laughs> and so I do want, you know, I, I can't say that I don't want to never meet, need money again. I would love to never need money again. But I have this understanding that I don't need it. That God is my true supply. 
<clears throat> but it takes a while to obtain that knowledge. You know, Claudia, I can share you a revelation, but that doesn't mean you're walking out of that yet. <clears throat> you can know that the Bible says that God is the only power there is. You can believe me saying that you have no needs, but until that becomes a revelation to you, then it's not going to work, right? Right. right. Uh, Kay, I like how Kay says it, if I, if I can remember correctly. She said, what we read out of the Bible is not God's Word. It's just words. It's just letters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't become God's Word until it becomes real to you. And so that's what we've got to get as we continue to study, like Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved. You know, I can tell Bill that God loves him and he's approved of you and you're righteous, but until Bill studies it and sees it, it doesn't become a reality in his life. Yes. So she obtained this. And, and because she obtained this, then he set that royal crown upon her head. And we know that royal crown pictures a covenant mentality. And that's what this lesson is about, is we're going to talk a little bit more about the royal crown and this covenant mentality. Once you know that you know, you walk out that understanding. There's nothing like walking out of who you know that you are. Exactly. Vicky wrote, I mean, Vicky, uh, uh, Judy wrote that song, Walking Out of Who I Know I Am. That's where these ladies want to get in the Netherlands. That's where we want to get. We want to learn to walk and live out of our spirit. And when we do that, I believe all things are going to begin to manifest. I believe that all mortality is going to be swallowed up with life because that just literally releases the life of God to do that. So in this last chapter of this book, we want to change gears a little bit. We have not begun to exhaust all the types, all the shadows, the pictures in this book. And again, like I said, we will revisit it again someday. I love teaching this. This is probably one of my favorite uh, lessons to teach out of the Old Testament is the book of Esther. And it will always be a vital lesson for the body of Christ. But the book of Esther points to how a believer can grow to the point where he or she can affect other people. And that's the key in everything that we're doing, family. We're not here to have, as Kay calls it, a better humanhood. Mm -hmm. right. we're, once you realize that you're called to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, you no longer study the Bible for you. You no longer come to church to try to get something for you. You don't come to church with a list of prayer requests before you, or you know, a, a list of testimonies and a list of all that. You come because you want to learn to be a blessing to other people. You, when there's an altar call, people come down. Your goal is to come down and minister to them. Exactly. It doesn't say you can't. I mean, we're not saying that if you have a problem in your life, we're not going to agree with you. But the, the sooner you find out that it's not about you, but it's about you becoming a blessing, the sooner these things are going to work in your life. I want it to flow through me, not to me. I found out that flowing to me doesn't work. Flowing through me works wonderful. Yes. And that's true biologically, so it must be true spiritually too. Amen? <laughs> if it doesn't flow out, you're in trouble. <laughs> Either way. So we want to affect other people. Uh, and we, we do that by our relationship with God. We find out that He is the King of kings, and we're those kings. He is the... Lord of lords, and we're, we're those lords. But the Bible, the Bible, the book of Esther, talks about a woman who becomes a queen, and because of a relationship with the king, that her nation, the Jews, were saved. Mm -hmm. And do, does not people need to be saved out there today? Yes. This whole world system, I'm not talking about saved the way the church talks about saved. Right. They need to be saved from a, 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 a religious system. They need to be saved from a political system, from a financial system, from a medical system. Whatever the systems are in the world, they're all corrupt. And yeah. God, people need to be saved from that. Yeah. You, you know, the, the, we've seen for a long time that the way of the loans and the refinancing, that's death, is it not? Yes. And the way of the medical field, sooner or later, it's going to be death. I mean, you keep depending on them for your health, they're going to do the best they can, but sooner or later, it's death. I was talking to the doctor the other day at the hospital with, for Frank's, uh, Frank Judkins, Melanie's husband, has to have quadruple bypass money, so be lifting him up in prayer. But the doctor told me 99.9% .9 of all people die with disease, not old age. And he said it shouldn't be that way. And I agree with that. We shouldn't have to die with cancer or a heart attack or things like that. If we are going to die and the body doesn't, uh, isn't swallowed completely up a lot, we could just live a long, long time. Yeah. Paul was an example of that. Paul did not die with disease. He had his head cut off. The Bible, as you study it out, it said he lived a, a, a old, he was an old, old, old man. I don't know the number of years, but he was very old before he finally realized it's time to go. <clears throat> so... We want to get to the place, this needs to happen in the age that we live in, because 
far too many people are living in the what I call the illegal realm of death. It is illegal for you to have cancer. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's illegal for you to age. It's illegal for you to have bad eyesight. It's illegal for all the things that we think that are just normal. You know, it's like that guy said in the, in the movie, uh, <clears throat> can't even remember the movie now, <laughs> the bucket list. You know, he said, oh, yeah. we live and we die and the wheels on the bus go round and round. You know, his mentality is it's just supposed to happen. We live and we die and that's what they expect. Well, that's a lie. We're supposed to just live. Jesus didn't come to say, I, bring, I come to bring life and death. No. He, said, he said, I came to bring life and life abundantly. And the Old Testament, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall reap the fruit of that or something like that. But what he was talking about is the understanding of the death of an old man and the understanding of the life of the new man. Does that make sense? And so if we love that understanding, we love that revelation, then we're going to reap that. And what that is is we reap life and life abundantly. So this needs to happen to us. Very few people, including people who call themselves Christians, have any understanding of the things of Father God. Last week we talked quite a bit about the things. A lot of people, I had one person write me and I wrote a letter back on Facebook about it, about what are the things. When it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. I thought, in my immature years, that if I seek the kingdom of God, everything that I've been praying for is going to be given to me. Because mm -hmm. I thought the things was more money. Come right, on. Ralph? That's what we thought. We thought it was a better better health. It was a nice car, a nice home, and never lack anything. But no, it's seek you the kingdom of God, and the word, the word of God will be added to you. Mm -hmm. The truth of what Jesus did will be added to you. Yes. You will then experience righteousness, and you will experience peace, and you'll experience joy, because you'll find out that all these works of righteousness that you've been doing is a waste of time. It's filthy rags. If Come you on. are working to try to become Come something on. that you already are, you're going to wear yourself plumb out. Amen. Yeah. And when you do that, then you are saying, I am not who God says I am. And you are literally Antichrist. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for Antichrist to come for hundreds and hundreds of years. And Jesus told the age that he was in, it's already among you. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's in you. It's in the religious system. It's in this political system. It's everywhere. Everything that the Jews were doing at that time when Jesus was here was totally Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Was it not? Yes. yes. And they continued after his death to want to continue to practice those laws. They even came to the Apostle Paul and said, you know, it's all right for these people to be Christians, but can you at least let them circumcise themselves? Can you just compromise just a little bit? And if he had it, it would have been totally anti everything that he tried to teach. Yes. And Paul knew his calling and he said, no, we're not going to compromise. So the consequences of being dead, which is no understanding, is man not experiencing life eternal. And what is life eternal? Jesus said what it was. He said life eternal is knowing him, which is Father God, and him who he sent. We need to have an infinite awareness of our Father. And we have a, need to have an infinite awareness of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And that's part of the Paul system of truth. I've had several people ask me, what is the Pauline revelation? And I guess people aren't real familiar with that. And uh, it's an Elizabethan word for Paul's revelation. You know, you can say this is Roy's book. Well, they, it's an Elizabethan word that's been used for many, many years called the Pauline revelation. Or you can just call it Paul's revelation. All of Paul's epistles was him writing about the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. But it's been mistranslated and changed and you know, to where people think it's just a good book to learn how to be a good person. But it's not. We must discover who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and who we are. See, that's part of the Pauline revelation. Who Jesus was, what he did, and who we are because of our identification with him. That's so important. And so what we need here, what we need here really bad is Esther speaks to us how a believer can grow and develop such a relationship. And that's what we're doing is we're developing a relationship. We're not saying God's changing you because you already are who he's made you to be. Yes. Vicky, I, I, I don't know why I keep saying Vicky. I talked to Vicky a lot this week. Judy Sohn, uh, wake me up. And Kelly sings at all times. says, God's not changing me. He's waking me up to who I already am. I thought in the past that he was changing me. I thought that I was just a sinner saved by grace. And I was always praying, God change me, God change me, make me a better person. Whatever it was, that's where we were at. But literally now I found that I already am everything that God says I am. That's the good news. 
You, you mean Roy, those people out there that are on drugs and they're prostitutes and they're murderers and they're rapers and they're they're uh, they're whatever. Just you can corrupt people in the business world, whatever. You mean to tell me that they're righteous and they're holy already? Yes, they are. Yes. And the reason they're manifesting what they're manifesting is because people that we have been, have called the church has never had an understanding that the gospel is the power to change a person's life. Come it's on. not them trying to change. It's not 12 steps to this and 10 steps to that. It's not you trying to clean yourself up. It's preaching the truth Come because on. the truth will make you free. Amen. Not just good little Christians. The truth will make everybody free. Unless they've already <clears throat> literally become a full manifestation just like before the cross, they were a full manifestation of Adam. Today, a person could be a full manifestation of a carnal thinking mind, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There are people in mental institutions today that are righteous and holy, but because of things that's happened to them, because of choices they made, because of uh, biological things that are out of order in their body, literally they have become to the place that they can't even understand a word you're saying to them. But do I believe they can be healed? Yes, I do. I believe there will be a day when the church rises up and knows who they are and they'll go forth like Jesus told the disciples and they will heal the sick, they'll recover the blind eyes with truth, they'll cause people that can't walk out of what Jesus has done to begin to walk out of it. Amen. Guess who they're waiting for? They're waiting for you. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for us Amen. to rise up and say, this is my mandate, is to go yes. set the captive free. Mm -hmm. And that's what God wants us to do. So, what needs to happen is... Once we understand these things, we need to go forth and rescue people. How do we do that? Well, we wake them up. People need to wake up. They need to be brought out of a place of non-existence. Most of us, most of our life, as far as who we are, we have lived in a place of non-existence. Yes. Correct? Correct. If you were a multi-multi-millionaire, but yet you lived on the street, literally you're living in a place of non-existence. You're not existing the way you could because of those finances. Well, if God is our true supply, and God owns everything, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing lacking with God, and we're lacking anywhere whatsoever, then in a sense we're still living non-existence. We're right. still not living as heavenly people. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to learn how to do that so we can help other people rise up and experience Him. We were risen with Him, right? We were quickened. We were made alive with Him. We were risen with Him. When, when were we made righteous? We were made righteous when... He was made righteous. Somebody told me on Facebook the other day that we're made right, righteous by faith in the Word. That's not true. We are already righteous right now. But it becomes experientially once we know and we believe. The Scripture said that He is the Savior of all, specifically those who believe. Now if He's the Savior of all, what does that mean? That means it becomes an experience if you will believe it. Yeah. But how can one believe unless a preacher is sent? How can one believe unless people like you are sent to go out and show them? So that's what we've been equipped to do. So <clears throat> from this content, there's a word, it's uh, soon igiro in the Greek, and it says to arouse from death in company with, to revivify spiritually in resemblance to. And in the King James, it means to raise up together or to rise up. That's what God did with us. That's what God did with us in the, in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And then it's also through the idea, the word is igirio, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but it says through the idea of collecting one's faculties to wake, to rouse from sleep, from setting or lying, from disease, from death, from obscurity, from inactivity, from ruins, from non-existence. And then it comes from the Greek word soon, which means denoting union with or together by association, companionship, and completeness. That's what God did in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He woke us all up. He brought us back to a place that we can manifest Him. And yet, like I said last week, for the most part, most people have never been fed this truth. We've been fed Passover, right? You know, everybody knows that they're born again that's ever walked in a church, but then there's a lot of people think they can lose it. But they were never fed the unleavened bread and everything else that taught them this right here, that this is who you are. You're no longer lying in disease. And I like where it says to collect one's faculties. I believe when Jesus in his earth walk went to people <clears throat> that the King James implied that they were demon possessed and all that. Particularly the man that was in the caves and he was breaking chains and everything and he came to Jesus. I believe what Jesus did is he brought him back to his faculties. 
I brought. I believe he brought him back to his mind because he had become a full manifestation of the state of human humanity, spirit, soul, and body. It totally destroyed him, and he was acting as a beast. But God brought him back to his right mind, and that's what people need. They need to be brought back to the right mind. Can you do that by laying hands on people? You know, I think there. I think you can. I. I, I don't think that like us, we're not that in that state. But I believe that we can go to people if God directs us to, and we can love them, and we can help them, we can pray over them, we can release life to them, and then we can begin to teach them. And I believe there will be a time that if they can hear or understand anything at all, I believe it can happen. I don't believe it's just touching them and it changes like that. No, I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying it never can happen that way, but I believe people need to understand it because if it's just a touching and a miracle, they can go right back to that same state. There needs to be some understanding. I always said when people come down and we lay hands on them and, and they do receive a healing, many times they lose that by walking away and they still see the symptoms and they say, well, I'm not, I'm not healed. Mm -hmm. And see, you're not healed because of your symptoms going away. Right. You're healed because what he did over 2,000 years ago at the cross. Yes. Most people's testimony is I'm healed because the symptom went away. No, that's not why you were healed. You were healed because what happened 2,000 years ago before the cross and you tapped into that and you agreed with that, right? <clears throat> so, if goes even further in the study of that phrase, he or she will find, it's, it's called Agora, means properly the town square by implication a market, a thoroughfare, or a city. So literally, we are the city of God today. He has wake, he's wakened us up to realize that we are the city of God. That we are more than a city now. We are Zion. We are the very heights. The whole world is the city of God. Now they are Zion, but in, and, but they are the city of God. Actually, the, we could say Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the very first maturity level. They're Jerusalem. They are spiritual Israel, right? But then they need to come to where they understand that they are the city of God. And that's the holy place. And that's where... God can begin to teach them, and, and a priesthood can teach them, and then you come to the most holy place, and that's where you Zion. See, we, most of us, have realized we are the most holy place temple of God. Yes. Paul said, what? Know you not that you are the naos, you are the temple of God. So we are actually Zion today. We are that. So when Father God's, or our Father's Queen, or Bride of Christ, wakes up to who she is, <laughs> then she'll come to this intimate relationship with the King. And that's all we want. That's, that's really what we're trying to teach people out there in the congregation. More than me and Butch and, and Stefan and Lonnie and, and Claudia and Melanie and Donnie, the ministers, more than us laying hands on you and praying for you, we want you to know who you are. I, I would rather you be able to draw from the life of the king than you have to draw from the king inside of me. I will release it to you. You, you can draw from my Christ life. But see, Paul was always saying, my God shall provide, my God shall provide. But he wanted to get it to a place where your God shall supply all your needs. When you know that he's your father, I mean, that's a pretty awesome thing. And when you know that he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. If you make your bed in hell, I'm going to be right there with you. I'm just going to be waiting for you to turn around and come back to me. Well, why is bad things happen in the world today? Because people make bad choices. Yes. You know? There are people that are born in poverty. It wasn't their fault. But the generations before them made those choices. You know, some people were born over in, uh, let's just say Vietnam, in very poor areas. Those children were born there. Because of choices that generations before them have made, that child is going to live in that kind of state. Unless one day that child wakes up and says, you know what, I'm not living this life anymore. I'm going to the United States of America. I mean, am I, that, is that clear? Yeah. Right. And, and let's just say people that live in uh, the ghetto in New York, they've been there all their life. Their mama's been there, their daddy's been there, their grandparents have been there, their great-grandparents. That's just the way it is. Well, some of them say, you know what? That doesn't have to be the way it is. I'm moving. I'm getting out of here. It's just like Esther's people. They were freed by King Cyrus to go back to Jerusalem, but they had been in confusion all their life. Babylon, they were making their living there, they had been born there, they had been raised there, they were comfortable in confusion. And that's the problem. Therein lies the problem that we see today. We have it in our church. There's in every church in the world there are people that's been just saved all their life and they're happy with it. 
Would you agree with me? Yes. And they don't want you to say you need to study. They don't want you to say you need to grow up. And it causes a lot of problems. But guess what? We love them so much that we're going to keep saying, you need to study. You need to grow up. We don't want you to die not experience life and life abundantly. We want you to come along with us. We're on a journey to rise up higher in our understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And if you're mad at me for that, you know, that just proves you're still acting like a child. Amen. My little grandson, love him with all my heart. He's 10 years old. You know, he's going to be 11 pretty quick, but we keep reminding he's just 10. He wants to play Minecraft. It's a game, or Minecraft, from the minute he gets to our house to Mama picks him up all day long. And it's just a battle. And, you know, and I get so frustrated, and I have to remind myself, he's a child. He's a child. You know, so I finally figure out what I'm going to do. He doesn't know I can turn the Wi-Fi off. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of fighting that battle with him, I'm turning the Wi-Fi off, and then... When he comes to me and says it's not working, I said, well, it'll probably come back on later on. Don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> you have to pick your own battles, don't you? Yeah. But he, he's a child. <clears throat> and I don't mean to say this badly, but a lot of people are still a child in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. come on. They, they don't know what's best for them, but we've been raised up to know what's best for them, and we're going to try to help them. And that's what you're being equipped to do. There are people in this church, and this is the only place we preach. I preach on the internet. I preach in this church. There are people in this church that I can't reach that you can. Claudia, Darissa, Lisa, I'm saying that on purpose, <laughs> purpose. No. Stacy, and uh, you guys, there's people that you've been with for a long time that I can't get to. They hear me out there, but they may not hear me, but they can hear you. So where's the first place that you need to go to with this message is our body, right? <clears throat> it's your responsibility to go to them. I go to people that I'm close to that will listen to me. But if we all get equipped together, then it's going to affect the whole body. Yeah. And I have great hope. I think Destiny Life Center has a great future. Yeah. I think this is going to be a lighthouse for our community. I believe that there will be a day that people are going to come from every corner of our cities. They're going to come and they're going to want to hear. And I'm not believing that just so we can have 300 people in here. I really don't care if we just have 50. I just want 50 that are equipped and hungry and they're out doing what God's yeah. called us to do. Because if 50 will do that, the numbers will take care of themselves. Right? Yep. So, we've seen that Esther's name means what? Star. Star, star that's right. A star shines the light of, of the sun. Uh, I mean, excuse me, its own light. Stars have... No, I'm wrong. They reflect no. right. No they, no, they have their own light. That's right. They have their own light. Yes. The moon reflects the light. But a star literally doesn't reflect like there's a light inside of that star that, that burns constantly. The, the sun is a star. Thank you for your help there. So literally, we're not reflecting the light of the sun. We are the light of the sun. God's, the Bible says that God is the father of lights. So God has made us a bright star. There are some stars out there that are still a little dim. They're still disclosed. They're garden uh, enclosed and well shut up. But that's beginning to open up. So we're stars. And a star picture is one who has been lifted up in a heavenly understanding. Most people think heaven means a place that we're going to go somewhere. Paul said, if I can remember the scripture, when Christ, no, excuse me, it, Paul was talking about the seated together in heavenly. And the King James, they added the word places. You still hear it quoted out there all the time. I still hear, hear other preachers quoting it, but it was not there. It says heavenly. When you think of heavenly places, immediately, immediately people think it's going somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That one little word could change the whole thing. But literally, we are at rest in heavenly. We have been brought up into heavenly understanding. We have a mindset, which means we have the mind of Christ, into a spiritual walk. And a walk is your life. How, anywhere it talks about your walk, it's your life. What's going on in your, in your, in your life. So it's a spiritual walk with Father God to where he or she is living out of one's spiritual resources. And that's what people want. That's what we want. That's what I'm constantly, Father, teach me how to live out of my spirit. I think one of the greatest ways to live out of your spirit is to be constantly casting down vain imaginations. Because does that come out of your spirit? No. I'm no good. I'm always doing this no. stuff. I no mess way. up. You know, we sit there, we take account of everything we do wrong all the time, and we agree with it. And then we try to determine why we act that way. That needs to be casted down. Just because I lied yesterday, that does not mean I'm a liar. Just because I stole something yesterday does not mean I'm a thief. I just acted out of a mistaken identity. I gave in to a temptation that came from the flesh. It did not come from my spirit. 
And so as we cast those things down, and how do you cast them down? You speak the truth. How did Jesus do it in Luke chapter 4? He had two temptations that he had to solve. Am I who God says I am? And am I here to take over? And he quoted the word. How can you quote the word unless you know the word? And I'm not talking about memorization. Memorization doesn't do anything. It's revelation. Would you agree with me? Yes. When you see a scripture and you have the understanding, you'll never forget that scripture. Right. I'm telling you, family, back before 1988, I couldn't quote you hardly any scripture whatsoever. I could quote Jesus wept. That's my favorite memory verse. <laughs> I could quote John 3.16. Yeah. A couple, but not very many of them. But when the Lord grabbed hold of me and made me a scribe and made me a teacher and I began to study, and as He showed me the understanding, it's there all the time. Now, could I sit here and quote 20 scriptures to you? Maybe, but I doubt it. But as I'm feeding the Word, as I'm sharing the Word, as I'm out in the world talking to people, it just comes to the remembrance constantly. The scripture says He will bring all things, the Spirit of God will bring all things to remembrance. He brings that to you when you need it. Yes. Not to pass some kind of test and show people that you you know 20 different scriptures or 50 different right. scriptures. Right. That's just intellect. But it's spirit. And I'm telling you, it comes out of you. And, and it's important for us. And so we have an understanding of God's purpose for His sons and, and what He did to attain it. You know, Butch told me not too long ago, how would you like to have a pastor that is a college professor? And I said, I would love to, but most people wouldn't. The problem with a college professor or a problem with somebody that knows some things is that they're always correcting you. And nobody likes that. And I realize that. I listened to my grandson talking about this uh, game called Minecraft that everybody seems to be playing right now. It's, 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 it's designing things. It's pretty neat. But I don't understand a word he's saying. He knows it very well. And I sit there and think, this must be how a lot of people feel about me. Because it's just in me. It's, I'm just. I'm. I, I'm not bragging. I'm just full of of it, and it comes out of me. But when I hear somebody say something that's contrary to the word of God, should I just leave them in that? No. You know, it, it's like Linda keeps. Linda doesn't mind me saying this. She keeps coming to me and telling me that she can't remember, and I'm always rebuking her because she can remember. Yes. But she's been saying this for so long, <laughs> and it's been said about her. That's what. That's one of her strongholds in her life. Right. Yes. But is it the truth? No. 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 But it comes out jokingly, but it still comes out. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got to have is some teachers can say, no, Claudie, it's, it's really, it's not this way. This is the way it is. Yes. You've been identifying with a wrong truth, but it's not the truth. You perceive it to be a truth, but it's not the truth. And the problem is it's, it's affecting you as though it's a truth. And I don't want it to affect you that way anymore. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't know about you, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. Come on. You may think you are, but you're not. People say, well, I can't learn these things. You're way over my head. No, that's not true. You can't because Scripture says that you have an unction of the Holy One and you know all things. You're just listening with the wrong part of your being. You're listening with your... You're, you're bringing what I say to you through your religious understanding and it, it goes ding, ding, ding. This doesn't match. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Right. Exactly. But I like what... God said in the shack. Max said, well, I thought you did this, and I thought you did this, and God said, how's that working for you? Exactly. And you've got to ask, all that stuff that you've believed all your life, how's that working for you? Exactly. Linda, people saying that you can't learn, and you saying I can't learn, and I can't, how's that working for you? It's just reiterating it over and over and over, and you can't, but that's, that's a lie. And these sisters in the Netherlands, when I finished their email and sent it to them today, I'm going to say, you know what? Before you knew all these things, before you knew everything that we're teaching today about true supply and one power and all that, and you believed that there was another power, you believed that there was a real devil, and you believed that God was answering every prayer that you asked, and, and for some reason, if He didn't, there must be something wrong with you, right? And you believe that he, He's going to change this situation and change that situation for you. How was that working? Did it work for any of you? No. You believe that if you put your tithe then you're going to get a hundredfold back. Did that work? No. No. Come on. No. And the truth is most of us were not putting 10% of our income in anyways, were we? We were just putting what was left over. So that didn't work. So if that didn't work, this is working. You know how I know? Because I have peace today. 
Yes. Yeah. Back out there, I had no peace whatsoever. Yeah. I knew that if I died, that I would be with the Lord. But there were times that I wondered. Come on. Did you, Ralph? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because of what we did that was contrary to what religion says. Mm -hmm. But today I know if this body lays down, I'm already with Him, so how can I not be with Him? There you go. Exactly. Today I know I'm already in heaven. Yes. <laughs> Amen. It, it's, it's a truth, literally, that makes you free. It, it, it wakes you up to who you already are. We know the purpose for God. All of us have the very same purpose, family. Yep. People have called me and written me, and Roy, can you tell me what my... What's the purpose in my life? Yes, I can tell you your purpose, and I said it earlier, is to feed on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you will just feed, you will become everything you're supposed to be. Yep. Darissa, you got children, don't you? Yes. Can when you had that baby, you didn't have to sit there and say, well, God, what do you, what do you want me to do with this? What's this child going to become? All you had to do is feed it. Feed and love it. Feed it, love it, educate it. It could become anything it wanted to be. I happen to believe that God has a purpose in everybody's DNA. Whether to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, a lot of people miss it. You know why? Because most of the time the parents don't nurture that. My son from birth was going to be an engineer. When he was four years old or five, he drew a fire station like you wouldn't believe. I mean, detailed fire station. He loved that stuff, and he's an engineer today. And I believe that there is a purpose in everybody's life, but more than just a job out there in a the field, your purpose is to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Every one of you, that's your purpose. God has called you to feed on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that all the Word, the things, all the Word works to good for those who love the Lord. That means seek after the Lord. If I love somebody, I'm going to seek to know you. It's stupid for me to tell Stacy I love her, but I never have a thing to do with her. <laughs> never talk to her. Nothing. That's not love. But for those who seek after the Lord to know Him and are called, in other words, will come to the table showbread and feed on that. If you feed on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will be everything that God ever called you to be. You don't need somebody to prophesy to you next week and say, Lottie, I, I, Lottie, I will just say Lottie. Lottie, I know your works and I know your labor and, and you're going to be highly favored to God and you're going to be so blessed someday. You, you don't need that. You know who you are already. There are people that need that and that's all right. But when you know, you don't need somebody to come prophesying but they not prophesy over you. So possessing Christ's life has never been another opportunity for a man or a woman to live a better life with their self-efforts. It's not a do-better way of life. Our Christ life is a power. It's a power to set people free. It's a power to help people. It's called dudamus. They used it when they talked about people talking in tongues, called it Holy Ghost and power. But your spirit is dudamus. It's the most powerful thing there is on this planet, is the life inside of you. It's greater than any bomb that they make out there. The life in you, when released, can restore this whole planet. It really can. It can restore people. So the spirit within us is the only power and it's the only force that will cause people to grow up into him in all things. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power to bring salvation to all people. And that word salvation is not say so you can go to heaven. It's sozo. It means wholeness. Wholeness. Spirit, soul, and body. If my spirit, my soul, my body is whole, to me that means it's one. It's not divided whatsoever. Isaiah 57 states that Father creates or brings down or cuts down from the visible realm the fruit of your lips. And it gives peace to all those who were alive then. It gives peace to all those who are alive today. And it gives peace to all those who are alive still in the body age and age to come. Literally, once you know these things, family, once you begin to speak the truth, it either brings it from within or it brings it from without. What's within you? Peace, right? What else is in you? Joy. What else is in you? Rest. Divine health. Rest. Righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness. When you know you're righteous, then you've got peace that produces joy, but you have divine health inside of you. Right? So there are some things inside of you that when you speak the truth, it draws it from within inside of you. Then there are things from without that when you speak the truth, it draws it from without. What is that? Money. Right? Food. Sustenance. You know, whatever it is. 
It's not that it's a name it and claim it. It's just I know that tomorrow, if there is a need for $50 tomorrow, I will have $50 tomorrow. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. That is a revelation God has given me. Okay? Kay Fairchild knows that tomorrow, if a doctor says, Kay, you have cancer again, Kay's going to say, yes, I may, but I know that that's going to go away from me. That doesn't belong to me. She knows how to draw from that because she has been given that revelation that sickness and disease cannot take her body out. Right. Mm -hmm. She has that understanding. Are we deifying ourselves and saying you need to you know, follow after us? Because we know we're just saying you need to allow the Lord to show you something. Mm -hmm. Some of you may realize that, that the, the salvation in the social realm where you get along with all people. Some of you may have other revelation that you understand and that you live out of. And then as we come together and begin to share that life and understand that life, then we become one and it affects every one of us. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I, I, I can't explain it. All I know is what God told me. I do not worry about money whatsoever. If you look at me in the natural, it would say, Roy, you're one or two or three checks away from bankruptcy. But I'm not. Because Father God is our supply. Now, we're not that bad off in the physical world. But I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. I don't have a retirement. But you know what? I'm not going to retire. Retirement is a man's thing. Yes. Work for 30 years, 25 years, and just go set and fish and die. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. And I'm not against that, Claudia. I mean, you need to get your retirement check, but you're never going to retire. No, All right. Sure. Absolutely. Unless, <laughs> unless your body dies. <laughs> huh? I can't see you just sitting down doing nothing. You're going to enjoy your life. But I believe that you have a mandate on your life. And I believe once that you're able to retire from the business that you worked at for a long time, you watch what's going to get ready to take place in ministry. <laughs> I believe it's going to explode in both of you. If that's a prophecy, then I prophesy that. <laughs> but I believe it really is. So, <clears throat> we've come to know the king in an intimate way. And we understand his perfect operation, which is the gospel. Then we possess the power which to live out of. Mm -hmm. And the, the Bible says in many, many places, they did not put faith in the operation of God. They did not put faith in the operation of God. The operation of God is what uh, uh, Ezekiel talked about. Show the house the house, and if they be ashamed, if they, if, they don't under, if they admit that they're not living as the naos of God, then show them the comings in thereof and the goings out thereof. That's the operation of God. He took something out and he put something in. He took out a force of sin. He put. He took out what Adam released and he put in Christ. Just like Monday morning, there's going to be an operational frame. They're going to take out or they're going to remove access to an old stopped up artery and they're going to put a new artery out of his leg in there. And you know what? Faith, uh, Frank is putting faith in that. Yep. you got to put faith in it. Yeah. Holy smoke for a doctor to cut you open like that and go right down to where your heart you you got to put a lot of faith in that with oh, yeah. that doctor yeah. and guess what Frank don't even know that doctor <laughs> I always say that all the time he doesn't know him he met him for the first time just a few days ago he hasn't even asked I guarantee he hasn't asked to see his license what gives you the right to operate on me it's just because he showed up they recommended him so that's a lot of faith, is it not? Yeah. And like I say, there's going to be some guy probably from India or Afghanistan or Pakistan. That's where most of them are. He's going to come in there and he's going to put Frank to sleep almost to the point of death. Yep. And he don't know the guy. Doesn't know what he was doing the night before. If he's out drinking or whatever. Doesn't know if he's a drug addict or anything like that. And then he's going to trust him to wake him up. That's faith, is it not? And yet, look what our God did for us. Yeah. And we have the hardest time putting faith in what He did. Why? Because we still go by the scene of the natural eyes. And then what somebody say that was funny? <laughs> What'd you say? I said, you're making surgery scary. I wasn't I know. Honey, it is scary. It is scary. I watched, I watched a video of a knee replacement before I had my knee done. I'm surprised I let them do it. <laughs> I mean, they cut your knee in half and they, they take a hammer with a chisel and beating on it. They take a saw and they cut your bones off. and oh, yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> Thank God you're asleep. <laughs> but I like to make that point because literally, family, once we, we put our faith in the operation of God, and I think that's where our biggest struggle is because we still see with our natural eyes. We still feel the symptoms in our body. 
I mean, I took some melatonin last night to help me sleep, and it's a natural thing, and it just kept me awake most of the time, but I started dreaming, and my, my muscles have been hurting a lot, because I don't, I'm, I, I need more water, and I need more calcium, because I do my low carb, but I dreamed that I had Lou Gehrig's disease, <laughs> and it was just a terrible dream, and they were wanting to know where I'd been in the world, and I said, well, one of my farmer's agents died with Lou Gehrig, and I was around him, I started thinking, did I catch it from him? And, and, and then I started telling how I'd been to Dominican Republic, I've been to Italy, I've been to Mexico, I've been to Australia, just trying to look where I could have got it. It was a horrible dream, and I finally woke myself up. <laughs> in my dream, I woke myself up, I said, wake up, stop this. You know, because we, we feel pain, and so we start thinking, oh, this is a big one. Yep. That's not faith. No. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you to ignore symptoms. No. If you have a symptom, yes, you need to get checked. But I'm just talking about fearing the economy, fearing your finances, fearing for your right, your, 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 your future. And that's where we all struggle with that. But I believe the more and more we study this, we're going to put our faith in operation of God, and nothing can come against our dwelling place. No weapon formed against us can prosper. I was driving up Indian Hills Road or Franklin Road or whatever coming here, and out there in this field, there's those, a beautiful tree that Don and I just love. We were going to take a picture of it because it had bales of hay behind it. But today we drove by there, and all that hay has been, has been harvested. And so the field is dead. It's just dead. It looks like the middle of summer. But this beautiful giant oak tree is in the middle of it. And it's just green as it can be. And the Lord just spoke to me right then and said, that's who you are. That's who I want my people to be. In the midst of what looks to be dead, their roots are sunk deep in me. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was a tremendous revelation to me because consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toss, they don't twirl, uh, toil, they don't try to be something beautiful. No. They just live who they are and they draw from what their, their, their roots are planted in deep. And that's what I am guilty of. I am guilty of trying to get people to plant their roots deep in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because if you can, yes, it's bad out there, but we're not out there. That's right. It's bad living below the sun. It's not life. It's the lower realm. And yes, it's going on. Yes, the economy looks bad. Yes, people are losing jobs. Yes, some people are making more money than you make. I got a call yesterday to counsel with a lady that people are making more money than she's making. Wanted to know if she should go threaten to quit if they didn't give her a raise. I said, no, the minute you do that, they're going to fire you. Realize that God is your source. Mm -hmm. And even if everybody on your job is making $10 an hour more than you, that's not your source. That's right. Exactly. Plant your roots deep into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and live out of that. Yes. And he said, Roy didn't say it, he said, I'll never leave you. He said, I'll never forsake you. He said, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And what are those things? It's the revelation of the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and your identity to that. Amen. And the sooner you can identify with that, the sooner your life is going to change. And for you ladies in the Netherlands, that's my answer. I'm still going to send you the email. But yes, you got children. All of us can say we got children that's got problems, right? Yeah. Every one of us. Some people have children that's in jail. I mean, there's some things you just can't do anything about in the physical. But you know what? You can sink your roots in and sink your roots in and let God make you a priest where you can go, then you can go and you can give them the answer. Then you can give it to them with fervency and understanding. When my son was seeking truth several years ago and trying to figure out there really was a God, I couldn't help him. I didn't have any understanding. I, I, I taught the Bible, but I sure didn't have this understanding. Today I can help people. If somebody's hungry, they want the truth, we can go through the Word and we can show you over and over and over that you can trust your God. It's no longer a self-effort thing. It's no longer trying to try and harder. It's no longer constantly asking God to do something. And that's where a lot of people struggle. I, I remember, man, I almost got excommunicated out of here a few months ago when I got up and I said that God is not in the business of answering prayers. That was hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it? Yeah. But is it not true? When you really think about it, mm -hmm. you know, you literally think he's just sitting up there waiting and Claudia prays and says, God, I need a raise today and God has a meeting with his staff and says, well, how's, how's Claudia been lately? Has he been a good boy? 
<laughs> Has he thought a bad thought this week, or did he did he look at a Victoria's Secret ad on TV at more than two or three seconds of the day? <laughs> well, yeah, he did, and he did this. He okay. Well, no raise this week. Or no, Claudia was really good this week. Claudia helped at the church, and he helped clean the church, and he's praying for people, and he's studying, and he's going to prison. Oh, good. Well, let's give him a raise. Do you really think God's doing that? No. Come on. But we've been taught that all of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he gave us tithe this week. In fact, he put an extra dollar in. Yeah. That's blessing this week. So we, we never allowed ourselves to think that stuff because literally, as Brother Garner said, we've lived in a Disneyland mentality. Yeah. We really have. Mm -hmm. That God has been our Santa Claus. And if you do good, he's going to bless you. If you don't, you're going to be the lump of coal. Right. That's not my father. See, that's why we need to study to show ourselves a proof. Amen. That's we, why, why we need to find out the truth. He's already given us everything we need. We just need to learn how to live out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, I don't think it's as hard as we make it. We think it is. Okay. When my company pays me, it's automatically put in my checking account every other Friday. And it's mine, bless God, and we live out of that. Yep. We write checks. Donna tells me what I can spend. She spends the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But we live out of it. Just that simple. Every other Friday we know there's exactly how much is going to go into our checking account, and that's what we live out of. And, that, and I think that we can realize and know that we have all things. It's not just a little bitty check account. We have all things in us. But what we have to use is wisdom, right? Yes. That's right. And knowledge that it's not there just for us. It's there so we can be a blessing. Amen. And I believe every one of you that way. I believe you're not here if it's just for you. Right. I don't, you wouldn't get up early and come on Sunday morning if it was. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important for us to understand this that uh, in closing that Esther pictures to us of people who are learning to live in and out of his or her reborn spirit we don't need to be forgiven we're already forgiven right we don't need anything we do need to repent sometimes and every time we study the word we repent what does repent mean we change our mind yep. a lot of you need to repent of who you think you are I tell Lena over and over and over, quit saying that, quit saying that, quit saying that. Mm -hmm. Right, Lena? And yeah. so, so what does she need to do? She needs to change her mind. I'm not who mom says I was. I'm not who the doctor says I was. I'm not who daddy says I was. I'm not even who the scores on my high school diploma say I am. I am righteous. I am holy. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I know all things. I am intelligent. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Yes. And we're not trying we're not saying it to try to get it to become so. We're trying we're doing it because the word says it is. Mm -hmm. God says it is. So we're the last man out of. We're new creation beings. We are one. And see, only that which comes from the invisible will produce anything which brings permanence to the visible. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Only that which comes from the invisible will bring permanence to that which is in the visible realm. If I work a miracle in your life somehow or another, I, you and I agree and we believe for it, and you receive a miracle, and I believe in miracles. A miracle is something that there's no other way it could have happened. It's not a miracle for me to call somebody and apply for a grant. Okay? Uh, I found out that you know hearing aids cost a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, a pair of hearing aids is about $6,000. Well, I can't afford that. I need a hearing aid. I mean, I need at least one. I'm, I've ruined my hearing been in church all my life. <laughs> right, Ralph? <laughs> Setting behind bass players and, and a sound system was so loud it was unbelievable so my hearing is really bad. Well, I found out that there's a seniors program that you can apply for and I did and in July I'm possibly going to get a hearing aid. Wow. And they, you pay a deductible according to your income. And I, I'm thinking it's going to be about $500. Well, you know what? I can't come to church and say, guys, I got a miracle. No. I pray that, no, I fill out an application and I got it. A miracle is something that comes from no natural source came into your life, right. right? So I believe for those, but they're not permanent. I've had miracles and they're not permanent. You know, I've had finances come. I've had jobs that I thought were miracles. They weren't, but there's some miraculous things that take place in my life. Well, like one, I'm a loaf of bread. Yeah. God was showing me a picture. You know, I've told all you guys, but for the internet, 
He, I, I, I prayed. I said, Lord, when I was very young, didn't make much money. Lord, help me get to the place when my wife asked for something I had the money for. She asked for a look. She said, we need to stop and get some bread after church. I had no money. Couldn't get any bread. And it wasn't a major thing. We wasn't going to starve to death. But I just prayed, Lord, help me to get to that place. And pulled out on 55th and May, went north, stopped at the stop sign of Southwest 44th and May, and the middle of the road was a loaf of Roman milk bread. Oh, cool. <laughs> now, was it a creative miracle? Probably not. It probably fell off somebody's roof or their car. Mm -hmm. But I just believe God was saying, you can trust me. It was and a I, miracle for me. It was a miracle for Donna. <laughs> well, the fact that it was Roman mill bread, because that's what we bought, was Roman mill bread. Oh, that's cool. And it was warm. The sun had kept it nice and warm <laughs> for us. And we got home and put our butter on it and just said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Not so much for the bread. But thank you that you're showing me that I can trust you. It did build our faith. Oh my gosh, it did. And, and it, our whole life has been that way, family. There's many, many times the Lord has reminded us that I am here. Before we even knew that He was our supply, He reminded us. Yes. Yes. Now that I know what I know, I can look back and say, Oh, that was God. That was God. That was God. That was God. That was the Christ life bringing that to me. And that's what we, that's what we want you to know. That's what we want to be teachers of is how to live out of that Christ life. Yeah. It was a mystery, but it's no longer a mystery. Paul said it's Christ in you. And I think what Paul was saying is you knowing, you understanding that Christ is That's your hope for the manifestation of it. The word glory means the very full weight of God. You know, Claudia is the glory of Claudia. You touch Him, you, you feel Him, you smell Him, you fellowship with Him. Right there is the glory of Claudia. And so... Me knowing that Christ is in me, that's the hope that it's going to glorify upon me. Amen. And people are going to see Christ. And do they not need to see Christ today? Yes. Oh, they yes. do. And that's oh, yes. what this is all about. Amen? Go ahead and stop it. We'll take some questions or comments. Real quick. We love you guys on the internet. We appreciate you. Keep sending your emails. I'll start calling the elephant.